Hurricanes. They're no laughing matter. It can take people months or years to fully recover. Imagine what it's like for underwater creatures with a surplus of gills and a deficit of opposable thumbs. You know, like fish. Now, people normally snap to attention and take shelter as a storm approaches land. But the storms spend most of their time out at sea. If you count the loss of coral reefs and other marine life, that's also where it does most of its damage. Some animals, such as sharks and other fast swimmers, are generally in the clear. Sharks have even organs known as lateral lines, which allow them to detect the changes in barometric pressure accompanying severe storms. These long, fluid-filled tubes are similar in form and function to a human's inner ear and are extremely sensitive to vibrations in the water. This is how sharks can hear the thrashing of injured prey through hundreds of feet of water. It also acts as an effective early warning system, like the National Weather Service for oceanic carnivores. When they sense a hurricane or tropical storm approaching, sharks respond by moving into deeper water only returning to their usual territory once the danger is past. Other creatures confirmed to have innate storm avoidance include various species of sea snakes. There's evidence that other fish species may be able to sense the pressure changes as well. Dolphins are another large aquatic species able to sense approaching storms, although they get there through a different route. Instead of sensing barometric pressure, dolphins can detect approaching storms based on how much salt is in the water around them. You see, hurricanes dump a lot of fresh water into the ocean in the form of rain. This temporarily reduces the salinity of the water near the surface, tipping off the dolphins that something might be wrong. As with sharks and other pressure-sensitive sea creatures, dolphins respond to this disturbance by fleeing into the deeper waters of the open ocean. But unlike sharks, dolphins still need to surface every 10 to 15 minutes for air. Merely being farther from shore offers a degree of protection from many of the hurricane's effects. Speaking of effects, what is it that has the kings of the ocean swimming scared? It has to be something pretty bad if this species needed to develop innate responses to extreme weather. The answer is a little bit complicated, but has to do with what happens to the water when a significant storm is overhead. It all begins on the surface where the gale force winds blow across the water to create waves. These waves get bigger the more wind they catch, and catch more wind the bigger they get. As this cycle continues, the water beneath the waves starts to move in a circular motion. This pulls on the water just below it until another circle forms. Soon, more form below that one. The hoops get smaller and smaller until they cease entirely explaining why so many creatures flee to deeper water. Things start to get really ugly when the storm passes over shallow water, and those circles can reach the seabed. Since sand and rock aren't quite as fluid as, well, fluid, the cycle gets interrupted. Instead of circles, the water starts to move back and forth across the seafloor. These rapid motions disturb the sediment, kicking up lots of sand, rocks, and even the occasional shipwreck. It doesn't take an oceanographer to tell you that all this flying debris is terrible for the local wildlife. Anything that isn't fast or mobile enough to get out of the way is going to find itself in serious trouble. So, who's still on the hook? Territorial fish unwilling to abandon their claims, and slow movers like seahorses are similarly jeopardized. Crustaceans don't fare much better, and neither do sea turtles or stationary mammals such as sponges, oysters, and sea cucumbers. I wouldn't like to get battered with several tons of sand and rock, and I'd probably feel the same if I were a clam. Fish also need to worry about the dust clogging their gills, and the swirling motion often deprives the water of oxygen. These same motions can also pull in the saltier water from deeper parts of the ocean, and many coastal fish aren't adapted to survive in such an environment. Now, there is one creature whose fate we haven't discussed, and it's one of the most important to any ocean ecosystem. Can you guess what it is? It's the first sea creature I mentioned. It's coral. Yep, that weird rock plant is actually a massive colony of tiny invertebrates. And these wonders of organic architecture are the centerpiece for a multitude of marine habitats. 
Hurricanes are an all-around bad thing for most aquatic life. For that matter, they're a terrible thing for any organism in their path. Coral is the closest any creature comes to being an exception. Moving water and flying debris are also known to destroy coral formations with ease. But that isn't always a bad thing. Coral fragments that survive their displacement can take root wherever they land. This is the primary way coral spreads to new locations. Unfortunately, this process isn't without risk for the coral itself. Fragmented coral is vulnerable to injury or disease, making its survival uncertain. There's also the possibility that the pieces can become buried in the sediment the hurricane kicked up. While the sheer volume of fragments guarantees that a few will take root, they're slow to grow. Such a cycle might have been sustainable once, but with coral reefs already struggling due to pollution and other factors, the damage just isn't being repaired quickly enough, as many creatures find themselves robbed of their habitats literally overnight. Hmm. Well, that's a sad note to end on, so let's not end on it. There is a ray of hope for the continued existence of marine habitats. People have been taking notice, and artificial reefs have been popping up around the world for quite some time. There are plenty of human-made objects that can double as fish and crustacean habitats and eventually become the foundation for a coral reef structure. Very often, the reefs began as repurposed garbage, with old ships and derelict oil rigs being among the most popular choices. The object in question will be sunk in a strategic location along an ocean current. The current carries plankton to the structure, which attracts small fish like minnows and sardines. In turn, these attract larger fish, such as tuna and sharks, as well as medium-sized creatures looking for a place to hide. Over the following years, the structure becomes encrusted with barnacles and corals. And just like that, almost before you know it, a new coral reef is born. Now, artificial reefs don't always work as intended. One early example was the now infamous Osborne Reef off the coast of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The reef was assembled in 1972 as a way to boost the local fishing industry while finding an environmentally friendly way to dispose of millions of discarded tires. The tires were secured with a combination of steel and nylon cables and anchored to the seabed by a circle of large concrete blocks. While things went well, at first, no steps were taken to make sure the steel cables wouldn't rust, which they did. A few tropical storms later, millions of tires wound up spread across hundreds of miles of coastline. Osborne Reef might be the simultaneous poster child for unintended consequences. Still, there are plenty of successful attempts at reef building around the world.